What's up, MCS Mahone here with The Up Collective, bringing you yet another fact-filled fun video about rotorcraft. You may recall in episode one, we said that the mass nut holds the rotor blades on, and that's true, but it doesn't attach to the rotor blades directly. Instead, it attaches to the rotor head. Have you ever noticed that the rotor heads of helicopters look insanely complex? You would think that we could just bolt the blades to the rotor mast and call it good, but that's not how it works in the real world. Instead, rotor heads look like this, or this, or this, or this. So why are they so complex? Well, let's find out why. The most obvious method of attaching the rotor blades to the rotor mast would be to just rigidly bolt them to the rotor mast. The problem with this method is something called dissymmetry of lift. When a helicopter moves forward, one blade is headed into the wind, we call this the advancing blade, and the other is moving backwards, we call this the retreating blade. The advancing blade feels airflow from both the spinning of the rotor blades plus the airspeed of the helicopter, whereas the retreating blade sees airflow from the spinning of the rotor blades minus the airspeed of the helicopter. This means more lift is generated on the advancing side than on the retreating side. This means that if we were to bolt inflexible rotor blades directly to the rotor mast, the helicopter would have a tendency to flip over once we started moving forward at any significant speed due to the lift imbalance. Fortunately, there's an easy solution. Free the blades to flap up and down. Allowing the blades to flap allows the advancing blade to flap up, which decreases its angle of attack and also the retreating blade flaps down, which increases its angle of attack. This effectively balances the lift across the rotor disc. Unfortunately, freeing the rotor blades to flap creates another problem. That's that the center of gravity of each blade moves closer to the rotor mast when they flap. This has a tendency to accelerate and decelerate the rotor blades as they move around the rotor mast. Fortunately, there's another easy solution, and that's just to free the rotor blades to lead or lag, in other words, hunt, as they please. This balances the motion automatically. So now that we know we need to free the rotor blades to flap and lead or lag, how exactly do we do that? There are three main solutions, and thus three main categories of rotor systems. Fully articulated, semi-rigid, and fully rigid. The most intuitive solution is to give the blades hinges to flap and lead or lag. This is called a fully articulated system. The two-bladed systems are called semi-rigid systems because they're free to flap as a unit, but not lead or lag. Instead, semi-rigid systems accommodate the blade's tendency to hunt by underslinging the rotor system. That means that the blades hang below the flapping axis, which keeps their centers of gravity the same distance from the rotor mast as they flap up and down. Underslinging does not completely eliminate the tendency of the rotor blades to hunt, but the rest is small enough that it can be absorbed by blade bending. The third type of rotor system is called fully rigid, and just like the name implies, it's when the blades are rigidly attached to the rotor mast with no hinges or bearings. These systems must use composite rotor blades that can bend greatly because it's blade bending that will accommodate all the flapping and leading and lagging. These three types of rotor systems are actually theoretical. In reality, there are many hybrid systems that blend the fully articulated and fully rigid rotor systems. Some have no hinges but allow for limited bearing movement in the feathering axis. By the way, pitch changing is called feathering. So you often see some rotors defined as hingeless but not bearingless. Here's an example of a hybrid rotor system. This is a fully rigid soft in plane rotor, meaning that it's fully rigid in flapping and feathering, but it accommodates fluid dampers to allow for some limited movement in the lead lag axis, hence the name soft in plane. It's made out of thin fiberglass yokes that can bend. If fully rigid rotor blades are the simplest mechanically and we have the technology to build them, you may wonder why they're not incorporated on all helicopters. It, the answer in a word has to do with vibration. Freeing the blades to move with extra flexibility allows for a smoother ride, which is greatly enjoyed by passengers. We'll talk more about vibration later. One common question is, if the blades are free to flap up, why doesn't lift just push them up forever? I love this question because it's not clearly explained in the text and a lot of helicopter flight instructors can't even give you a good answer on it. 
In fact, if you're a student, go to your flight instructor right now and ask them the question and see if they can give you a good answer. Fortunately, I have a degree in aerospace engineering. Oh, oh my god. god. Wait, where are you guys going? Don't you want to know the answer? No. Okay, so the answer is that the blades are feeling the combined effect of two forces, lift and also centrifugal force. Centrifugal force is not an actual force. It's just the inertia of the main rotor blades pulling them outward. This is similar to if you were holding onto a ball and spinning in a chair, uh, I don't know why you'd do that, but let's just say that you were, you have to hold onto the ball with your hand. If you let go, it just shoots out tangentially. The rotor blades would do the same, but they're bolted to the rotor mass, which holds them in. This inertial force, called centrifugal force, is much, much greater than the lift. Engineers often use a concept called vectors to illustrate this. Vectors are just arrows where the length of the arrow is proportional to the magnitude of the force. So if a 3,000 pound force is this long, then a 30,000 pound force is 10 times longer. When you add the two vectors together, you can see the result is that the blades cone upward at a slight angle. This is called coning. I'm gonna run through this calculation at the end of this video. The other question is if the blades are free to flap down, why don't they just hit the ground when they're not spinning? Obviously when they're spinning, they're coning, but if they're not spinning, why don't they just hit the ground? It's because of the static stops, which are these little flapping restraints. They, in the case of some rotor systems, they're just a piece of metal. And in the case of semi-rigid rotor systems, they're these weird bunny ears on the top. It's easy to think of a rotor head as a single part, but mechanics know that it's actually the combination of many parts. These include the trunnion, the yokes, the grips, the blade bolts. The rotor blades are kept in track by the mechanics by adjusting small fins on the trailing edge of the blades. These fins are called tabs, and they're physically bent by the mechanics as necessary to keep the blades flying in the same plane. Also, the blades must be balanced very, very accurately. This is made more complicated by a concept known as moment of inertia, which is the physical distribution of the mass of an object. The perfect example of this is a hammer. Here's a weight of near identical, well, weight. A hammer is one foot long, but all of the mass is distributed in the head of the hammer. When you drop these, one has a tendency to spin and the other doesn't. This is because although they are roughly the same weight, the distribution of the mass is different. This means that even if the rotor blades are the same weight, they may be out of balance when they spin together. This requires mechanics to adjust tiny weights in the ends of the rotor blades until they fly together perfectly. Even paint on the rotor blades changes their mass distribution. And yes, the balance is so sensitive that even tiny paint flakes can cause a noticeable difference in the ride quality. If the paint chips off over time, the rotors have to be rebalanced. All this spinning, you can imagine, creates a lot of vibration. And we have several different ways of mounting the transmission to the airframe to eliminate some of this vibration. These methods can include rubber elastomeric mounts or fluid-filled dampers. Leaf springs, like you see on pickup trucks, these leaf springs are called nodal beams and are actually from a Bell Long Ranger. Okay, let's review. The most logical way to attach the rotor blades to the mast would be to bolt them directly to it. But due to dissymmetry of lift, the helicopter would flip over when we moved forward. This means we have to let the blades flap. But the blades flapping causes them to accelerate and decelerate as they move around the mast due to something called Coriolis effect. So we have to free them to lead and lag, aka hunt. There are three generic ways to free the blades to flap and hunt. Semi-rigid, fully articulated, and fully rigid. And also some sort of hybrid between rigid and articulated known as a fully rigid soft and plain rotor or some other one like the one on an A-Star that I guess is kind of weird too. That's it. That's why rotor heads are so complicated. But now you can go out and impress your friends by telling them about the three main types of rotor heads and why they are the way they are. See you next week with another fun fact filled video about rotorcraft. And remember to hit that subscribe. I'm MCS Mahone. Oh, sounds like an alternate extra. Alternate extra. The following demonstration may cause queasiness in the math allergic. We talked earlier in this video about how the centrifugal force on an individual rotor blade is much greater than the lift force, but let's run through that calculation real quick. Let's just say we have a helicopter with a 36-foot diameter. Let's just say we have a helicopter with a 36-foot diameter. The centrifugal force is quite a bit greater than, the, and that's the reason that it cones at the angle that it does. 
This has been an Ultra Nerd Extra. Thanks for watching and we'll catch you next week. I apologize for the audio. Right now there's a really annoying ND500 that won't go away.